Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. I'm Peter Gross, co-host of the original Wild Kingdom with Marlon Perkins and Jim Fowler. Most of us have seen movies or television shows where sharks have been portrayed as marauders who prey on unsuspecting swimmers or smaller fish in the sea. But many Wild Kingdom episodes illustrate how sharks and other predators are an important part of the food chain in our underwater world. Oceans cover 70% of our planet, yet we still have much to learn about this important ecosystem. Modern technology has enhanced our ability to study the oceans with minimal disruption to their habitat. Human involvement and recent legislation to protect underwater creatures allow for the resurgence of these many species. There's more good news to come in the Wild Kingdom, so sit back and enjoy Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom right here on RFD TV. Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom is presented by Mutual of Omaha, people you can count on. Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. There are only a few areas remaining in the world where man's presence is so rare that wildlife living there does not react with fear when he appears. One such area is located in southern South America, here in the area of Argentina known as Patagonia. Recently we journeyed to this enchanted land at the invitation of the Argentine government to observe wildlife and some of the scientific research being done there. On hand was the newest member of the Wild Kingdom team, Dick Denny, who is widely recognized as a distinguished scientist in wildlife and conservation projects throughout the world. Because the abundant wildlife along the Patagonian coastline is amazingly tame, research scientists interested in studying seabirds come here from many countries. Nesting on the shorelines are multitudes of kelp gulls, which lay their eggs in slight depressions, and large king cormorants, which build more of an actual nest. There are also great colonies of Magellanic penguins, which most often nest in burrows. Our chief interest was observation of nesting birds, but we were fortunate enough to witness one of nature's most amazing sights. It occurred when several 25-foot killer whales virtually beached themselves as they preyed upon young elephant seals in the shallows beside a steep drop-off close to shore. It is undoubtedly one of the rarest sights one might encounter in nature, and it all began when we first set foot on the wild shores of Patagonia. The shore of the Valdez Peninsula of Patagonia's northern coast is sometimes abundant with elephant seals, but not right now. The breeding season has passed and the great bull seals have gone. Only the younger seals and cows remain, shedding their winter coats. Here and there, yearling bulls spar with one another, gradually learning the fighting skills which will serve them well when as adults they must fight rival bulls of tremendous size for dominance over large harems. The practice fighting rarely lasts for long and pleasant basking seems much more enjoyable. Totally ignored by the seals, a long-built oyster catcher is not in the least afraid to move close among the bulky animals in search of small crustaceans dislodged by the seal's movements. The relatively few elephant seals which remain here will soon be gone too. Now they simply catch fish and relax in what seems to be an ideal security. But such is not the case at all, as the scientists are about to discover. Dick Denny has joined Dr. Don Bruning Curator of Ornithology, New York Zoological Society. What we've encountered is a killer whale following the steep drop off along the shoreline within mere feet of dry ground. As a matter of fact, there are several of them, including some young ones. 
They're evidently on the lookout for seals in the water. This is something very few people have ever witnessed because there are few areas like this where the conditions allow it. Here, the huge whales can come in with ease to within a few feet of land because of the abrupt drop off of the beach to a considerable depth. Thus, when the tide is rising and elephant seals like these are swimming or even merely wading in the shallows, they become vulnerable. All of the seals act oblivious to danger, and now the killer whales are moving in very close indeed. Since these adults weigh many tons each, it is hard to believe that they might actually thrust themselves out of the depths and almost onto the dry beach itself after elephant seals like these. Those seals on shore probably are safe, but those in the shallows are perilously close to the drop-off where the killer whales are lurking. One of the larger seals indulges in napping at an especially dangerous time and place. It was a lucky seal which somehow sensed the danger this time and avoided it. The loss is of no great concern to the killer whale. With the multitude of seals in this region, almost certainly another will become careless before long. From what we've been able to deduce from the actions of this killer whale and her calf, she's on the verge of showing her offspring how to attack. The lesson begins in earnest. The young elephant seal decides to have a swim in the shallows. expected it, were stunned at the suddenness and finality of the attack. Now a second female killer whale makes her move at a seal that is in water only inches deep. sort of cat and mouse game now takes place between the killer whale and the seal. She sets it free, but then continues to hover close, nudging it and giving her baby whale below an opportunity to test its own ability at grabbing the seal and pulling it under. fortunate seal hasn't really escaped. The young seal has been released deliberately by the whale so that once more she can demonstrate for her young one the hunting technique. Sometimes the seal
seal is allowed to escape three or four times into the shallows for repeated captures before finally being devoured. But this present lesson is over for the young killer whale. And now it's time for us to observe elsewhere. In this idyllic land where the wildlife has never learned to fear man, another mammal which appears in vast numbers on shore is the southern sea lion. These animals line the mainland shores for miles, but they haven't come here to breed. Later, in another area, the huge bulls will bellow out their challenges and gather harems of cows. But this present place is just a hauling out area, a place where the whole rookery of sea lions can rest before moving on to the breeding area. The bulls may weigh three-fourths of a ton and are noisy and ill-tempered. And now, as breeding season nears, tempers grow even shorter. But mostly, the bickering among themselves is mild and the animals get along reasonably well together. Now and then, among the sea lions, an elephant seal can be seen resting peacefully content and fully accepted, and ignoring the incessantly squawking kelp gulls. Quite abruptly, the whole assemblage undergoes a chain reaction plunge into the water. Our unexpected appearance triggered the mass movement. Though numerous here, these animals represent only a small portion of the total population inhabiting South American coasts. Surveys indicate there may be around a million, of which 200,000 are found along the Argentinian shore. Although the sea lions are interesting to watch, they're really not our chief concern. It's time that we get to the area where penguin research is underway. This is where some research involving Dr. Bruning is occurring. Our studies here deal with the Magellanic penguin, which inhabits this coastline in huge flocks. These are fairly good-sized penguins, very distinctively marked and having a length of about 28 inches. The pinkish flesh around the eyes becomes slightly more pronounced during the nesting season. The penguin's beak is quite strong and sharp-edged for catching the small fish and squid which it eats. As with all the penguin species, Magellanic penguins are superb swimmers. They're also highly gregarious. The penguins spend much of their lives standing close together and often move about on land or in water in very tight groups. While Dick continues observing here, I'll move along to where some of the more definitive research is being conducted by the Argentinian penguin expert of the Centro Nacional Patagonico, Jose Luis Garrido. He's studying not only their population, but also their relationship to other birds here. Most Magellanic penguins nest in burrows, which they've dug themselves, which helps prevent skuas from stealing their eggs. Yet sometimes, the nest is made in just a slight depression on the bare ground. Whichever the case, Jose Gurido must attempt to determine the nesting population in this colony. To do so, an area 10 meters square is staked off, and an accurate count of adults, chicks, and eggs is made. Once this is done, then aerial photographs can be made so that a close population estimation for the entire colony can be figured.
though sometimes they'll snap at intruders in defense of their nests. Normally, the penguins are rather docile and can be approached closely for study. The tilting of the head back and forth does not seem to be an aggressive movement, but rather appears to be done to see the intruder better. One of the most persistent predators on penguin eggs and chicks here is the kelp gull, which nests in the same area. Anytime a gull spies a penguin chick left unguarded in a nesting cavity, that chick is immediately in grave jeopardy. The penguin studies being conducted here will be of benefit in determining what the habitat requirements are for the survival of this species. Even though the birds nesting on the wild shores of Patagonia were not molested by man, there were bold predators among them who would steal eggs and chicks given the chance. Dr. Bruning describes the skua as being especially detrimental to penguin chicks and eggs. Skuas nest on the bare ground, and their eggs are mottled and well camouflaged among the scattered pebbles and rocks. The eggs were laid almost three weeks ago. So now they're close to hatching. When I asked Dr. Bruning if the angry cries from the parent birds mean that the skuas might attack us, no reply is necessary. Sometimes in nest defense attacks like this, they'll actually strike the intruder, so it's wise to duck if possible. Now both parent skuas are attacking us, and for safety's sake, we'll move away from this nest area to calm the big skuas. The uproar involving the angry birds back there has caused the skuas to be mobbed by a group of kelp gulls who don't want those predators anywhere near their nests. Aerial squabbles like this are not at all uncommon in this extensive rookery area. Toward the coastline over there is where the most concentrated nesting is occurring. In that particular area, the eggs of the kelp gulls are in the midst of hatching. Now, even while guarding their own chicks, the gulls keep close watch for the possibility of one of the adjacent penguin nests to be left momentarily unattended. If that occurs, they take immediate advantage of the situation. There is always great competition for food in the rookery. We've arrived at the very peak period of the hatching of the kelp gull chicks. The chick probably hatched late yesterday or early this morning and the one still in the egg, no doubt will be fully emerged before sunset today. Off to one side, Dick's attention is caught by an area where a sort of corridor exists between nesting gulls and nesting king cormorants. The king cormorants nest here in large colonies, 
and are jealous of their territories, even among themselves. A bird pausing too long in other than his own area is apt to be pecked. Also, a nest left unguarded is almost certain to be robbed of its better nesting materials. Such thievery occurs so frequently that the whole breeding colony is often alive with birds stealing nesting material from other nests nearby, or having their own nest disrupted by others stealing from them. When sharp squabbles break out among the gulls, it sometimes causes fright and confusion among the gull chicks and they cross into the wrong territory. Instantly, such a chick's in jeopardy, and there's nothing the parent gull overhead can do to help. The chick must quickly get out by itself or perish. This chick was fortunate. He's finding his way out. And the parent will be there waiting. The chick is safe again. And now it's time for us to move on to other areas to continue our observations. The beautiful isolation here provides perfect habitat and natural sanctuary for wildlife. And natural beauty of a type found nowhere except along the wild shores of Patagonia. Altogether, too few areas exist in the world today where wildlife remains essentially untouched by man. Areas such as the wild, austerely beautiful shoreline of Patagonia provide the last real haven for many mammal and bird species. Where else can one see huge whales hunting within mere feet of the shore or closely witness the breeding activities of the world's largest seal species? Where else can one encounter such extensive areas of shoreline so suitable for supporting vast breeding colonies of seabirds. A few such areas still exist, and while they do, it behooves man to set them aside as permanent sanctuaries for the perpetuation of the species which require such habitat. In that way, the wild shorelines can continue to play their highly important role in the delicate balance of the wild kingdom. Mutual of Omaha, people you can count on, has presented Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Mutual of Omaha, helping people find Medicare solutions for over 50 years. To learn more about plan options or how to protect your kingdom, contact us today. Mutual of Omaha, protect your kingdom.